Okay, well, okay. welcome everybody to in session number eight. It is number eight today. Uh, oh, wait, what? Hey, nobody can see us. Nobody oh. can see us. There we okay. go. That oh, worked. We Hi, everyone. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello, and that's Marcus, as you probably know from previous no, sessions. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. I was inspired by also. Um, your uh, tree stand, Isabel, so ah. I added oh. uh, decoration here. Oh, very nice, very, with, very nice. With the similar help of an auto pole. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Magic arm, the Christmas, Christmas, the new Christmas stand. Yep, <laughs> very versatile. So, um, well, maybe we should say what in session is. Uh, okay, you want to say should. it this time? Sure. Um, in session is our um, well, what is it? Our broadcast, basically, that we've been doing since May, maybe April, May, where we invite people or people contact us mm -hmm. and uh, we talk to them about their work and um, answer any questions they might have um, about right. touch designer or their projects. So it's a really good chance to talk, mm -hmm. not just to uh, um, Isabel and myself, but uh, we look that we always get people from the company, like the, our developers and um, uh, anybody from the company basically to join and be the right people to talk to you uh, about your projects. And if you would like to be part of that, then you should go to the URL that's down here, uh, derivative.ca slash in session. And at the bottom of it, it's a little bit like explained what we, how it works. And then at the bottom of this, there's a registration form where you can register your project and basically let us know that you want to partake. And we would exactly. be very happy to hear from you. Yeah, because we're going to be doing this again in January and February and Correct. March and, uh, yep. for the foreseeable future because, because it's been, it's been really good sessions and today's sec session will be no exception session exception but none, no, no exception should we um, should we um should we see who is who we have today yes yeah. you want me to uh, today we're very very excited to welcome uh, Louisa Lesso a Danish new media artist and creative technologist based in New York City where she just received her master's in the interactive technology program at Tisch hi Louise I'm not done with the introduction. <laughs> um, so Louise has very interesting work. She creates uh, interactive installations and projection works that seek to raise ecological awareness and also explore the limits of human perceptual system. And uh, all of Louise's work is interactive and it's all based on scientific fact and data. So it's a very, very interesting body of work and we'll be looking at some of it today and talking more to Louisa. And we also have Malcolm with us. Oh, we definitely have Malcolm with us. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, to uh, chime in at any time. And Louisa, please uh, direct your questions also to anybody of us. And uh, the magic internet makes it also possible to ask our coworkers if we don't know answers. Mm -hmm. So we are well prepared. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> So, uh, so we had a long conversation with Louisa yesterday, and uh, um, we're going to sort of review some of that today. Uh, let's start. Should we start with your your personal background a little bit, Louisa? I mean, you've had a really, really interesting uh, education. I'd say education career almost so far. I thought it was ten years, but it was only eight years. <laughs> so it started in in Denmark and um, at. Uh, your first Bachelor of Science, Digital Media and Design. And then I'll let you, uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna tell the whole story, but <laughs> please. Um, yeah, I started, I started my, uh, my educational career, as you <laughs> so, so nicely put it, um, in Copenhagen at the IT University um, with a degree in interaction design, which was the first degree in interaction design done in Denmark um, at a university. We also have CIID, which is a Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design, a world-renowned place, actually. Um, but they are not a formal degree. Um, 
but those two places in Denmark were the places that were pushing the boundaries for like what is UX design. Um, and coming out of high school, you know, what you gonna do with your life? And I knew I was good at drawing and design and stuff like that. So I decided to try and go in that direction. Um, and that degree was just uh, UX design thinking and uh, a little bit of coding, mostly web uh, stuff. Uh, but not really a lot of, like, a little bit of hardware, but not, not really what I wanted, I think. Um, but I have, like, a very strong foundation in, in design now. Um, and then, you know, it's 2012, and there's kind of a financial crisis going on. I think I've been hit by financial crisis three times. Every time I graduate, there's financial <laughs> crisis, and I think I'm cursed. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so, so maybe you know, maybe don't graduate for the next. Yeah. There's always no, recovery. No, my, my educational career is done. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but but uh, what was interesting is you're coming out uh, as a interaction designer, and it's the first batch at all in Denmark, and then you have to kind of convince uh, people in the all, well all of the different paths of careers that you could possibly follow to actually hire you because. Nobody at that point were thinking in terms of uh, the stuff that an interaction designer does. So nobody was thinking, oh, user research is really important. Um, they're more like, no, we, we're doing the things we've always been doing. Like, I really was actually hit by that. And luckily, I've read book upon book upon book upon book on how to convince people. <laughs> um, the self-help convince people books? And now this the UX <laughs> design book. Okay. Like, oh, you're going to save so much money by doing the user research and not designing the wrong thing. Um, so that's really what an interaction designer does. Um, I've, I've later done like interaction design workshops with uh, students um, in high schools and stuff. And, and the way that I the way that I love to explain what I do is that I, I just ask them, have you ever got, walked up to a door and um, open it in the wrong direction like, ever and they're like yeah sure yeah <laughs> okay how many minutes of your life do you think you've wasted doing that and then something sort of dawns they're like oh my god that's so many minutes um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe hours maybe uh and then they're like wait okay well then what is interaction design well it's just that you know before i even get to the door i know intuitively whether i need to push or pull that door mm -hmm. and it's not a dumb sign <laughs> yeah, no, yes. It's, cool. yes, in some random language. Uh, it's funny yeah. that that's uh, my interaction class in Weimar. The teacher had, as an example, American doors versus European doors, because American doors often have on one side you have a push bar, on the other side you have a handle. So it's, right. uh, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So. yeah. Yep. And also, I mean, doors are supposed to open out in case of fire, but it's amazing in how many how many circumstances they actually do the opposite, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and all of those things go into what is good interaction design. Mm -hmm. um, so, so anyway, that, that was like my whole education is about understanding how to think like that, mm -hmm. um, which made me think a lot about ideas coming from users. So I was like, after that education, honestly, I was kind of crippled in terms, because I was good at drawing and good at art and stuff before, but I was kind of crippled in terms of doing art because now I'm like, oh, but what does the user want? <laughs> um, and I think when, if you're thinking too much about what the user wants or, or like you cannot make a decision uh, unless you know exactly what the user needs, um, it's hard to do art. Uh -huh. um, so I ended up, I worked with uh, cultural marketing and uh, cultural events for a while two years and then I decided I don't I don't really want to make this market research and stuff like that I actually want to make the event make installations for these things um, and then I decided to do a degree in programming so that I could actually create these magnificent pieces was that the um, medi mediology uh, that was mediology Yes, which and is still, still in Denmark. In Denmark, yeah. Okay. 
Um, so that degree is at Aalborg University uh, in Copenhagen. Versus uh, several campuses in, in different um, different cities, and that is like a really hardcore computer science degree with uh, sort of a nod to art, but not really about art. Every time we did a project, we had to do an 80-page report that stated how we implemented things, how we tested it with users, how we implemented new things based on those tests, um, and like statistic validity and stuff like that. Um, so very computer science, um, signal processing, uh, 3D modeling. Very, very wonderful basis for actually what I do now. Um, and everyone I know that has that degree has actually gone on to do really, really good stuff. So, uh, Did you have to I find really your way a little bit with that uh, amount of topics that it offers you? Like you, um, during the time you develop your uh, specific interest or is it more after? Yeah, that degree is interesting. Well, actually, why I chose to do... I chose to do that degree, which is another bachelor's degree, because you cannot learn to code in Denmark on a uh, master's level. They already expect you to be able to program. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to do a second bachelor's degree, um, which was great. Um, but you don't have any tailoring. So it's just, this is the degree, these are the classes. You have like two electives that you can take on the last year. So it's a three year degree. Um, and then I, I was like, I want to go to where these, so I, I did some, some, some cool projects there, worked with my, my uh, bachelor's uh, thesis was uh, working on a theater production in Miami actually. Um, I, like, I want to go to a degree where I can absolutely tailor my program. And so that's when I then went to ITP uh, in, at New York University, uh, which I just finished in May. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it takes you through all the... Uh, I mean, it's funny because it really takes you through all the stages of... Um, uh, installations, interactivity, user interaction, mm -hmm. and um, fine arts, where it mm -hmm. kind of all comes together, where you then maybe figure out, and perhaps um, your thesis at Tisch, where you did, like, there was an installation that is an installation where you much more are an observer as a, um, as a visitor, as a human, and the technology is acting towards you. Mm -hmm while the things that you did before in between your first degree and your second degree when you worked for a festival, like where you did a festival installation, it's so much the user control is in control. So you did a nice you reversal there. Yeah. I flipped it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I um in working from working away from like the idea of just strict UX of what does the user want and, and like how to make this thing functional. Also beautiful, but like functional uh -huh, first. Uh -huh. um, I think that then coming to an art degree where, um, where you have to think about like experience first and feelings first. And coming from computer science background, you're not very trained in thinking about feelings, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> Design background, yes, then computer science. Okay, no, we forget about feelings, maybe a little. Um, and then you come to art, and art is all about, like, what is the feeling that we want people who are present with this piece to, to experience? Um, and, and yeah, so I ended up, uh, I ended up going into more, like, robotics for, for my thesis on, on ITP. You're seeing, like, a, a, just a bunch of really different project yeah. here, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Marcus, can we cue oh. that video? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so, okay. so this is this is my thesis, and it's um. Oh wait, sorry. It's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be a. Um, Let me fix that. It's still working on on the production of it, um, but it is a series of branches that are plants that uh, protrude from a wall. And it's really flipping what you were saying before, Marcus. It's really flipping the idea of the user in a space with an installation. 
um, because I I found that uh, in my research, like I, I was thinking a lot about what does it mean to be human and what is like the human condition right now. And then COVID hit, and obviously everything was like even more. Oh, everybody wants to go into nature, oh. uh, and then the human condition <laughs> became like, oh no, we can't go into nature. But actually, what I've been thinking about for a while at that point is that we kind of forgotten about nature. Like our best relationship with plants is our house plant. We get like generally sad if we don't know how to take care of it. But like street trees and stuff like that, we don't we don't really care. A street mm-hmm. tree only lives for ten years. Did you know that? That's like Wow, that's not mm-hmm. less than your kid, you know? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's less than you, it's awful. It's it's less than a dog. Yeah. Um and we also and we also have a sort of idea that we can control nature, right? That we, I mean, we control it. We we sculpt we sculpt our parks and geoengineer our environments. So nature is definitely something that we see as beneath us to a degree. Yeah. So I got I got very very interested in those uh, aspects of like what does it mean to be working with technology. Um, so if you're hearing like clanking in the back, that's my heater. Um, <laughs> um, so I wanted to flip the interaction um, and try to ask with this piece, make a really, really slow art piece about uh, uh, how much we think we're in control of nature. So it's robotic plants. Um, but actually use that to tell the story of how plants, how, how slow their time scales are. So basically, this is a robotic sculpture that um, does does interact with you, but not on your time scale. It reacts uh, it reacts on the time scale of uh, a mimosa pyrogon plant, which is uh, a specific plant that if you touch it, it pulls up its leaves to protect itself. Um, which means that now it's not doing photosynthesis, right? Because right. it most of all of the the cells that, that do that. And those are on the, the top side of the, the leaves. Um, and then it actually bows down to like, kind of like signal that like, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm hurt or it, that's what it reads like. I was doing these experiments showing this plant to people and asking what they felt. Um, and they're like, oh no, don't you're hurting the plant or something like that. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting because I can make an interactive sculpture that's about that. So this is an incredibly slow sculpture that asks you, there's motion factors on it, so it asks you to slow down. And if you do not slow down your movements to kind of match the same mm. movement level the plants in the room, the branches, um, it will do that same dive and kind of you have to wait until it, it's time for it to have recovered. And that takes like a really, really, really painfully long time. So if you I- want it to go in there and enjoy nature and the beautiful like Lumia light that they make, um, you have to move very, very slowly mm. in there. Slow nice. yourself on that scale. And I, I got really interested in, in that sort of like reversed embodied interaction where it's not, because you, you go to any interactive installation, it's always like stand and wave. <laughs> how every, what did you see everybody doing? And I was like, how can I do the opposite of that? Mm-hmm. If you do that, it's punished. Because the insulation will simply die for a while. Yeah. Um, nice. So, I think it's interesting when, when, like the social dynamics in the insulation become a discussion between people. Um, so, so you know they, uh, you have to like tell the guy who's just coming in. Excuse me, don't walk so fast because you'll hurt it. Like you. Oh to slow down like and then it becomes a human to human discussion right about so, how to properly engage which i think so is really interesting so were people who were already in the installation space and who figured it out advising newcomers on how to behave that's the idea that's cool. the test very nice um i have yet to install it uh because i mean i just finished this in may and right now no galleries are installing like um it's sort of like very. Everybody is asking me for you know augmented reality pieces and yeah hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so so we have I mean 
haven't produced the other 20 branches <laughs> yet <laughs> that will be cast in metal and stuff. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm actually, um, I've been applying to residencies to try to, to get this one up because it's quite like it's quite a costly installation to build actually with the, the metal mm -hmm. casting and stuff. For sure. And mm -hmm. motors and yeah, because mm -hmm. it's all these. I mean, many, many, how many, how many moving, how many joints are there? Um, there will be two joints in each. Okay. Um, right now I have, right now I have three joints, but they're, I'm changing it to two. Um, and it'll be a slightly different mechanism. Um, but it's still like right now it has three motors. It has one for controlling, um, the, uh, you can see that the, the leaves are sort of um, on these wires. So it has one for controlling, pulling those in and out. And then it has two for managing the weight of the branch um, or just flipping it up and down. Um, but it needs to be simplified and thinner and smaller and these things. Uh, so I'm working on it now with a, a 3D printer that just got added to the oh, That's very nice. Yep. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> look forward to seeing that, and well, actually, look forward to visiting that. <laughs> yeah. And so what I'll usually do in an installation like this, because this is a touch designer talk, um, is that I'll focus <laughs> I've, like all of that interaction in touch designer, because uh, that is the best is how I do it. Um, and for this particular one, each branch will have uh, an amount of health, um, and it will each have a sensor, um, and then. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is that it, eventually it'll be completely embedded on a, like a, a small Arduino Wi-Fi connected board in each one, which won't be the touch designer code, but like all of the prototyping will be done in touch designer as like a big integrated uh, system where I'm just sending Wi-Fi messages between the two because I need sort of like a stored data bank between all of them where if one it detects like a uh, too fast movement, it will alert the nearest neighbors, which will then alert the neighbors, which will then alert okay. the neighbors. Okay. That's how it functions in real forests. And this is, like I said, m my art is based on like real data, real science. Mm -hmm. This this will take it uh, one third of it, one third of an inch per second to re like for the signal to reach, because that's what it takes through fungus. I was uh, just going to mention fungus, but I didn't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rupert Sheldrake and his it's whole... possible yeah. to mention fungus in the year 2020. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, uh, you just you just released uh, a new video last week for uh, Candy Stations, where you did, uh, you did the visuals, am I right? Uh, yeah, so Candy Stations uh, is uh, actually one of the reasons that I even got into this field. I feel like huge shout out for she does. Um, uh, Candy Stations has been a visual artist for so many years now, and she does all the visuals for So Ken Stevens, um, and she does uh, Tate Vincent, just a bunch of my favorite artists. And I was at a concert uh, many years ago, and I saw her tour design for um, So Ken Stevens, and I was like, I have to do this. This is what I want to do with my life. Um, and so when I when I moved to Brooklyn, I reached out to her and asked her if she wanted to mentor me. Um, so it's quite beautiful. And then now I, um, I got to work with her twice now on her um, visual design. So this is a music video with Sarah uh, Kirkland Snyder uh, called for this project that she she did called Mass for the Endangered, which is very much up my alley with like the. Yeah. Uh, the animals and the plant lives and how we should come up for nature. Uh, so I'm super happy that she asked me to work on it. But I did the, uh, I did all of the the assets, like the handling of the assets. So the way it works is that she does a beautiful storyboard and then she will send it to me along with Cinema 4D files. Um, and then I put it all into Unity and Touch Designer and do like post-processing stuff of uh, uh, like she wanted this butterfly flock to move over on this time queue and circle up the um, the totem pole and she wanted the totem pole to look a certain way 
and she wanted these star animals um, that are up in the sky. Um, so Beautiful. I do that, and then she actually does uh, the final uh, compositing. So it's like it's like this beautiful teamwork um but she has like she does all the ideas and i'm just the implementer which is super nice to just be that once in a while mm-hmm. you're just yeah. like i want it to look like this and i'm just like okay cool yeah it's kind of meditative work yeah yeah i, I guess it requires a lot of um ingenuity what's the word Ingen- ingenuity ingenuity yes uh to uh, take take a visual and or of an idea and be able to translate that perhaps an art form in itself as well yeah because you're you're translating something which that's uh and if it comes out the way that um, your client or uh, whoever asks you to do it uh likes it then that's a uh, great success for mm-hmm. that so you did um that means you did basically certain shots, uh, did um, modeling in Unity or bringing in assets. Um, you yeah. said earlier you then um, shifted that over over into Touch Designer and did some more sub work, sub related yeah. uh, mesh deforming. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can I can talk based on this what we're seeing right now in this video. So this is so these animals are all animals from the Unity asset store. So I didn't have to do any modeling. Uh, but then uh, Deborah Candy Station, she said, I want these animals to be a totem, but they should still move. Um, and I was very sad because I was like, that is really difficult because uh, you know, you have, um, whenever you do a 3D animation, the animation is baked into to the mesh. Like, and you can't just like delete part of the mesh. You can in, uh, you kind of can in Cinema 4D, but Unity, that is ridiculously hard. Um, and still keep the animation. So I had to write a custom shader that actually shaves off the butt of the elephant in order <laughs> to just get that head to be on the totem. So it's literally a camera clipping plane that goes only onto the um, animal, each animal that needed its butt hit, basically. Wow. Um, animal butt then, shaver shader. Animal yeah, butt shaver that's, shader. That's what I call it. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, no, and obviously I didn't write that completely, uh, you know, from scratch alone. I, it took me like five days of hardcore uh, looking around what everybody else had done in, in Unity to, to do that. Um, and then the same animals, what we're seeing now is the touch designer part. So all of this, um, these animals, the way that they move, um, oh, cool. in the Zodiac here in the Zodiac, mm-hmm. that is all done in touch designer where, um, I grabbed the same animations, put them into touch designer in an FBX, um, the new, uh, FBX importer, um, what new or new and new, <laughs> uh, old. Uh, new to me since it, there were some changes since <laughs> last I used it. Um, but yeah, so I imported, um, I imported each one of these animals from Unity, and then I, I'll show later um, how this is done. But uh, but basically, I deformed the mesh live with the the uh, animation data, so to actually get the the mesh moving. And that was my issue. I wanted to put stars. Um, on on the uh, vertices, I wanted the mesh to be simplified because it needed to be more like a zodiac and less like a 3D mesh. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's uh, it's the the um, simplifying the mesh first and then the deforming the mesh, and then of course then making a whole system that does like the stars and and all that. But I'm going to share a tutorial. We were talking about this yesterday. I will make oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Tutorial. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to point out another, also an installation that you did um, as well. And just because stars came up and everybody likes space, or there's a big community, I think, in the mm. touch designer community within that is um, space, uh, space addicts. Is yes. it addicts it or... Uh, Absolute addicts. Enthusiasts, yeah. like uh, yes. Isabel herself. But then we did. We have the whole. Cr- we have the whole crew who did uh, the Grantican with uh, Romano Corrado. Right. Rowdy. 
and uh, 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 anyway, I won't go into naming names. But anyway, so but back to uh, back. To, I think you're going to go to the harp. I missed right, it again. Marcus? Yeah, my okay. back button doesn't work anymore. This is ridiculous. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there is exactly, yeah, there's the Cosmic Harp and the Cosmic Harp on first sight looks like an interactive installation where you play the, um, uh, when I get to the video, you will see it, where you play a harp with laser. But the sound actually is based on something else. And that would be interesting to know what you did there. Uh, yeah, so um, the Cosmic Harp, which is a collaboration with uh, one of my classmates, uh, sit show. I did this uh, while at ITP. Um, is uh, a laser harp because that's fun to make, uh, mm -hmm. but also because actually a lot of communication out in space and protection of the planet is done via lasers because the laser is a light beam that can push in space and actually push matter away, right? Because it, it is quite a powerful light beam. Um, so they're like right now they're experimenting with uh, pushing satellite trash away from other satellites oh. by equipping with lasers, which is quite interesting. So this piece, um, uh, I decided it should be a about that, uh, about uh, how much trash is out in space <laughs> and how we're protecting ourselves. And uh, it, it's uh, inspired by armillaries which is, uh, if you don't know armillaries, the easiest way to say it is like, remember Dumbledore's office? He has like all of these doohickey round things with the, the track planets and stuff. Oh, there. yeah. <laughs> um, but it's the old way of tracking, um, of tracking planets and the zodiacs and all that. Um, and so I decided, well, what, what if this interactive installation actually tracked in real time, the space track, the space trash above us. So that's what it does. The uh, sound uh, more spaced on how much trash is passing by above, like right now, in the 200 kilometer radius from where it stands on Earth. So it basically gets a lot longitude and latitude, and then it uses uh, it uses uh, data from NASA to uh, see what is what is up right there right now. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very nice. And, and there's and, information about where those libraries are coming from and stuff on my website. If anybody's interested. Cool. Uh, Good. Yeah. Um, and, and, so, yeah. And right now you're, you're playing with smoke, right? You're, you're playing, you were using smoke as the, uh, as, as the trigger kind of, right? Because, because yeah. we don't have people. Yeah. We were talking about, um, we we're talking about COVID, COVID restrictions and changes and stuff yesterday. And um, and one of the changes that we have made, uh, so this was supposed to, uh, it's it's already gone up in the Cosmic Heart form, but we're actually making a new version, which is here behind me. Uh, I can walk over to it at some point, but uh, this behind me is uh, the new version, which will be three harps, one that tracks the SpaceX uh, science um, satellites, one that tracks GPS satellites, and one that tracks uh, communication satellites, and they'll each have their own sound. Um, so they kind of make a choir when they're installed. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to go up on uh, on this uh, um, festival called Illumination uh, here in Brooklyn in November, but that got postponed because uh, numbers started rising again. So first, you know, working on it, but, but the big, big change is that we have incorporated um, not smoke because smoke and electronics mm. not always good. The grease gets in there and stuff. Right. Um, so we we're actually using a humidif humidifier now, oh, a, okay. a reptile humidifier. Maybe. Um, maybe. Um, yeah, <laughs> oh, it's a reptile humidifier for a aquarium <laughs> um, that we um, put into it uh, in the center. Let's see if I can. And, I and the smoke is then the actually activating the laser harp. It's not just, just yes. to visualize it, but is actually playing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're. Um, that's that's our our big COVID change. Is that. Well, you, you can still, obviously, you can stick your fingers into the laser and it, it, it will still activate. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing about um, building these these lasers, and I don't mind saying how I build my stuff because I I love that people will experiment with it too. But it's a laser harp is is a laser pointed at a photoresistor. Uh, so, and then an Arduino that's checking how much current is going through that resistor right now. So it's basically like sort of an on-off thing if you're hitting the laser or not. And it's actually incredibly um, uh, precise. So so you set a threshold, um, you can have smoke be the interrupter. Um, so that's what we're doing now. Um, Um, this is uh the the home the home studio um and here is this newer version where uh, let's see if the smoke will run there we go so smoke here it's hard to see because it's there um, yeah. So uh, it's kind of hard to see on this. Uh, there. Mm-hmm. But it is there. So yeah. It, it, the thing about lasers that's really interesting to me, also in, in terms of like space and communication, is that uh, you know, as humans, we literally don't see them. So the ones up here that aren't getting any smoke right now, you don't see them. Mm-hmm. And that's like the smoke up there. Greg's asking, how do you get the laser to point exactly at the lens, uh, at the sensor, and keep it that way? Like, are they, um, yeah? How do you, how do you adjust it so that it's actually precisely on the sensor? Yeah. So I, uh, I work with Sit Cho, who is a, where is I? There, um, I work with Sit Cho, who uh, is uh, from Taiwan and also studied ITP, and he's a um, like a wizard when it comes to mechanics and uh, making. And so he uh, has made for us these uh, custom uh, 3D printed uh, fits that we're, we're still working on. on them. Let's see if I can dive you in there. Wow. Um, yep. Here, so basically uh, this is a new design and each each of these have both a uh, photoresistor receiver and a laser. The laser is there on the right, I think. Mm-hmm. It's my right, it might be your left. Can't tell. Um, the laser is there. The right, yeah. The photoresistor is here. The photoresistor is behind um, a red sheet of acrylic right now, which is an experiment because red will only let red light in, right? It'll. Um, it won't let well. It'll let let less of the white light, meaning the ambient light, of the room in. Um, so that's how we're like filtering it just a little bit. We could use like a leaf filter or you know something that's that is really only made for uh, letting in specific types of uh, specific wavelengths of light. Um, but right now we're just like, what's the cheapest option? <laughs> um, and then, yeah, we point this, and honestly, uh, you yeah, glue it. Once <laughs> uh, it's pointing where you want it to point, you kind of got to glue it, because uh, especially here in New York, it has not been a problem um, back in Denmark. But in New York, there are a lot of places where you might install your work which is mm. on top of a subway station in yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, those little shakes constantly will mess up any projection mapping and any um, well-calibrated laser. Yeah. It's um, a so. good point. Yeah, you got to account for that. <laughs> uh-huh. Things yeah, you find so out the first time you install it, I guess. So, I mean, they are like... Um, as you saw, they're, they're 3D printed. They have uh, custom fittings um, that uh, I can I can adjust with screws and stuff. But but um, 
we might have to to glue the the actual once it has the orientation we want we might have to glue it mm -hmm. yeah hey mark marcus should we dive into uh um louise's uh um shade of toy touch designer and then we can come back out and talk more about sure, yeah. and it's education a, and art. And uh, I guess that's a good, I mean, a good way over into that, actually, because um, as a lot of the things you build are running on Arduinos or um, and you said that you're prototyping interaction in touch designer sometimes, but stuff then moves into often into hardware and um, um, I'm not sure if we mentioned that you're currently working in James Scar. Clark's studio at James yeah. Clark's studio the and artist. there the light, is the light. the light artist and there as well you're um, using uh, what are they called raspberry pies to yeah. um, and one of the work that you've also published then on the community side is actually a converter from shader toy over into a touch designer shader from where you can take it more easily into raspberry pi I believe if I understood that correctly yeah. And that would be very nice to look at, yeah, if you yeah. would want to walk us through that. Look at, I would, um, do you have the videos from the uh, asset? Because then I can talk over that. Uh, from which one, start sorry? With. Uh, from, from the asset page. Do you have that? Oh, sure, yes, I can get that one second. Uh, and I can talk over that, that's the easy way. You were saying that you like to work with shaders and touch designer because of the nice debugging, debugging tools? Yeah. Yeah, shaders. Um, so I was taught shaders in Unity, actually, in CG, not even GLSL, um, in my med mediology uh, education. And shaders uh, are, to me, like they're such a powerful tool, and they're so, um, so many programmers are so afraid of them. Like, like dead scared um, because it no I don't understand it's it's very weird it doesn't think like other codes which is true you know everything runs every frame the same piece of code on every pixel uh, which is different so you're not like writing for loops uh, and you can't so much uh, do like oh what was my last frame I want the color to change based on like there there are things that make people afraid of uh, shaders. So I've dedicated like a big portion of my work to make this easier for people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, both in P5, uh, which is like a program that a lot of beginning programmers use. Um, and then also in Touch Designer because we need that. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. So I dropped this asset, uh, what, like a, a couple weeks ago. Um, on the asset store, which converts uh, from Shader Toy, because Shader Toy is a big online resource of free shaders. Just remember to tell, you know, remember to tell the author you're using it. Remember to uh, follow the license that the author posted. Posted, um, but it's basically this tool that allows you to go onto Shader Toy, copy paste the shader, hit one button in Search Designer, and then have the GLSL shader working in touch designer um so when you download it you'll see this you get um that i have three in there that are already copy pasted in uh and you get this system right there which already does the mouse you can see the mouse is is moving the the cloud um lighting um so um, i already preloaded all of the vectors that are normally on on shader story. The only thing I haven't put in that is actually the keyboard. Uh, not a lot of them are use it. And audio I haven't done because, well, I didn't need to do that because on Raspberry Pi audio doesn't work for the LED screens I'm running anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I can add it. Um, and I will because I'll need it as a mother point. Um, and I'm sure everybody else will too. So basically what you do is that you you can copy paste one of these or you can just use them as they are but you go uh and just add the the code in there so right now i'm working on um 
a piece that will be on an LED screen that is about firefly communication because it's nature and its communication is interesting to me. Um, so I typed in firefly and I will just copy paste this code. And then what I'll do is I'll put it in there and I'll hit the converter key and then a converter button. And then now I have it there. And then what I will actually do is then I'll muck about with it inside of Touch Designer and like maybe make a level uh, brightness and like see how do I make it look more like I want. And then I go into the GLSL code and play with it uh, until I get it to where I want it to be. But what's nice just for the community is that, you know, then you can make a base or whatever and you can copy paste in the system into the base and now you, now you have your, um, your shader ready. Um, and then you can make another one. Um, Go from there, yeah. So that, yeah, that's a pretty easy process to get from uh, shader toy into your own uh, complete encapsulated um, shader version there. Uh, yeah. Nice. And now you have it there and you can, you know, make it a talk, you can mm -hmm. reuse it in all your projects. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously on the, on the GLSL, right now I've set it to be like 100 by 100 pixels, but yeah, you can just... That's the beauty of shaders, you know, and that's why I'm so fascinated with, so I do VJing as well, and, and, you know, you can tell it to be however big and, you know, you, you need for, mm -hmm. for a giant, giant screen, so, yeah. Uh, and then how this project actually came about was that uh, I saw it, uh, James was, uh, James Clark that I worked for was working with, uh, uh, with this sort of stuff on uh, an LED matrix and I was like, oh, I bet I can make this generative for you, and I bet that I can also make this uh, a much more easy, like, one-button-click sort of process. Um, and then, you know, I think that's a valuable asset, so I decided to share that. So that's the second part here, which is a button that converts it to run on a Raspberry Pi. So I wrote... Um, I wrote a repo that is based on Pi 3D. Pi 3D is an already existing like 3D way of making games and stuff in uh, on on the Raspberry Pi. So I reached out to their community uh, and got in touch with uh, Patty. Um, who without him this would not have not have worked um, because uh, Patty is a is able to to you know help me make this work in the same way as it was in in touch designer so i was like well i want to run this on a 4k screen is there a way to like down sample the um shader in a way where you can't really tell but it, it is down sampled hmm. so he like all these little finicky questions that i had uh he would like give feedback. So we have like the longest email thread you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> um, but anyway, what you do here is that um, these these videos are on the asset, by the way. But you just you co copy paste it into the download it repo, um, and it will run on the Raspberry Pi. Just like that. Um, <laughs> just like that. Huh. Nice. And, um, there are some some shaders obviously that don't convert even if you go into shader toy um you know there are some some shaders that don't run on shader toy they're just like blank um so yeah those don't work because they already don't work on shader toy um and then um there are some that are that take like many many inputs and stuff like that uh where they're using a shader buffer and another shader buffer and another shader buffer and i haven't implemented that yet um because that's, that's a lot. <laughs> the nice one, yeah. yeah, yeah. But very nice, yeah. And from the Raspberry Pi, you're, um, that's in, there's libraries then that directly connect to your LED um, matrix, basically, yeah. to then yeah. drive it from there, yeah. Yeah, so you'll see here that, uh, so what I did is that uh, a lot of people within our community, or like within the Touch Designer community as well, they use these LED screens, right? Um, and the ones that you can run from a Raspberry Pi are these ones that are called Hub 75s, which 
a hub 75 is just the um the um what's it called the 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 thing that the connector that goes from the pi to the the um the, the, LED. the board the, LED the board, board itself yeah um the led matrix uh and and they're they're like made by adafruit or they're made by uh, all these chinese manufacturers um and they're quite they don't really connect to a computer without having all this hardware in between um so i was interested in like well can we make this can we use like touch designer as a conversion tool but also as a prototyping tool and then finally output the shader onto something that i can have as an embedded artwork where i don't need like a big touch designer uh computer running it can it run off of a pie you know um so not, not because uh touch designer isn't great i just cannot include a huge machine a, a, a huge risky yeah. machine yeah with, with like a, a tiny little led screen artwork in a gallery um so that was kind of uh that was kind of a challenge also from from uh, from james clark's um Mm -hmm. side you know like how can we make something that's more generative and that um yeah so can we do this so of course we can there's <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of questions in the chat one of them is uh, uh what kind of things do you have to do to to the touch sign of shader to make it work with the raspberry pi um so i had to um i had to write First of all, I had to write like a, a a Python script in on the Raspberry Pi that does. There, there's a whole repo that you download. It's all on GitHub. Um, but you, I had to write a um, thing that passes in all of the same variables into the shader code, and that's done in a very very convoluted, annoying way on the Raspberry Pi um, compared to other shading languages uh, or other. Um, yeah, compared to, for, for instance, in, in Touch Designer, where you just fill in those vectors. Mm -hmm. um, you had to, I had to write uh, a Python uh, code. So you'll see in um, in these codes, uh, should we, we can try to get it up and running? Should we do that? The uh, sure. oh. Yeah, sure. I can connect that. I'll show you live. If I can spell my name and enter my password correctly. Oh. And let's see. Should already be. Um. Back. Let's see. There we go. Uh, we're having a, are we seeing it? Yep, got it. Oh. We're having a computer situation here. Because Parsec is on a uh, window. Okay. Uh -huh. Marcus. On, on the Mac, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. On the Mac, you can only uh, dial into another computer. You cannot share your screen, basically. Marcus, are you going to go full screen? So it's oh, yeah, visibility? sure. That's a good Good point, yeah. All right, so um, here I have uh, here I have it running already on the uh, on the Pi. This is uh, part of the artwork that I was working uh, games to create, and this is the this is the shader tool that we were just looking at. So basically, if I just turn it on. Uh, any one of these. That, that's just like literally a copy paste from um, from the shader toy will work. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, you know, we have the resolution right here is only 100 by 100 because you don't really need the converter to be that high res, do we? Um, so, and this won't do anything on, on the Raspberry Pi. These, these resolutions because you have to set the resolution you actually want on the Raspberry Pi anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I have the Raspberry Pi running here. Uh, 
next to me. It's running on that. And then I have actually a VNC uh, server into it, which should already be open somewhere. Let's see if it threw me off or. Yeah, so, and I hope none of you uh, hack me because, uh, oh, cause you, anyway, they buy me because I did not change my Raspberry Pi password. <laughs> Please don't hack me. Um, I just installed this for, for our demonstration purposes today. <laughs> so here is uh, the you Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so safe. Um, here is the uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, what you're seeing on on the actual screen, and then here is the the tiny little shader that's 32 by 32 pixels running mm -hmm. on this. And because the matrix is 64 by 32, it's duplicating yeah. um, the signal. Um, but what you actually do in on the Pi side is if we just take the, the very, the most simple one, and let me just take one that just runs on, uh, that doesn't even run on the matrix, it's that just runs on the Pi screen, is that here is a Pi program that, that I wrote, which is based on Pi 3D. Thank you, Patty, for all the help. Um, is that you set a resolution here and then you um, pass in, you pass in sprite uniforms. So mm -hmm. you're passing the I time, the I time delta and all that. And they have to be passed in in a certain order. And this is like really low level um, addressing basically. And then inside and this is this is the code this is like the boilerplate code that he touch designer patch as on top um is up here that these get put in correctly right yeah passing them in and receiving them correctly but they, they're like low level addresses so um it has to be done this way but that's that's what i had to do in the converter in touch designer to um to run it. Somebody was asking, and um, the question was answered already in the chat as well, to control um, things on the Raspberry Pi from TD. Is that something that you have uh, done, or <clears throat> there's not really the need oh, well, for it? When is that coming, guys? Oh, that should be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the answer would be a TD, uh, um, then or attached designer OSC, and then the Raspberry Pi, I guess. As yeah. one way to go between them, yeah. But yeah, that's probably what I would. <laughs> that's what I would do. What you were asking um, was when Touch Designer will be on the Raspberry Pi. Um. Were you? <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to know. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I really want to know. That's what we were talking about yesterday. Ah, uh, what's that happening? Maybe Malcolm knows. Uh, I'm putting him on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> not soon, I don't think. <laughs> Sounds like a big job. It does sound like a big job. I was like, <laughs> is there a minimum? I was, I was thinking since we talked about it yesterday, if there's like a minimum, just just a minimum, it'd be great to run this or that, you know. Um, but yeah, there's, meh. But because you know, like processing and stuff runs. So that's another way that I've thought about running something is, is to, to put it into processing. Um, I do have a, a colleague of mine named uh, Aiden Binkle, uh, who, together with um, this uh, girl, uh, Sohaila, um, they just did uh, an installation fully of these same sort of screens um, with just um, just the Raspberry Pi. But they did all of the pre-processing of, of the, the video that they wanted to run, and they did all that in Touch Designer. So. So I was on a meeting with them just yesterday because they had a, a small exhibition um, talking about the same thing that, that basically, yeah, it'd be great if, you know, just just the, the video plug-in or something could, could be done. 
Um, I will say though, for this screen specifically, uh, maybe there can be a um, layer. Some of my other friends are working on a, uh, a LED controller. Um, it's called the Brightly, and right. they, they promised me that they will eventually be supporting these uh, screens, so you can actually run these screens directly from uh, um, from Touch Designer on your PC in like a in like an easy, no sweat way. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so far, they're running all of the new pixels and all of that. Um, so I've been I've been beta testing for them. It's it's great, great work. They have a talk later with the. Uh, that cat, that lab. Nice, yeah. Huh. yeah, that's. I guess that's the the Raspberry is fairly restricted in what it supports. Um, uh, Malcolm, and that's our main issue, right? Yeah, I actually don't really know much about what its actual capabilities are, and mm -hmm. so it's yeah, it's a very hard question for me to answer because <laughs> I don't really know what the limitations are and where. Uh, where things would be difficult to do, and where, where things wouldn't be. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, Greg does mention it. It does run. Touch Design does run on the like the Intel compute sticks for like ultra low form factor. I'm sure, they're quite a bit more expensive than Raspberry Pis, but right, yeah, it's kind, of, kind of the middle ground. Dollar Raspberry Pi. Yeah. <laughs> that's computes. that's why I became interested in in this because uh, yeah, this is running the Matrix now, but there's also code in libraries like. Um, like this one that will just run it directly on on the screen. Uh, so here is the shader um, that's that's running on the screen. Uh, we can of course make this full screen. We can make this take up. Uh, the biggest uh, I've been running where it was like completely perfect with this particular shader because it's a bit heavy. It's like doing lighting calculations um, in, inside of this fog volume. So if I use the actual mouse on the Raspberry Pi, um, I don't know if you can, you can just about not see that, but here's my mouse. If I use that, um, you won't see anything on this right now, but just watch the screen. Um, so this one will actually um, react to my mouse clicks. Um, yeah. um, so, so it has all that same capability of... Uh, if I drag, it'll it'll actually move smoothly. So it has all the same capability of, of a shader toy. Mm -hmm. But what I was interested in is like, well, if, can I run like a 4K screen from a Raspberry Pi? Um, because then I don't need, if it's not a too difficult of a shader, then, then maybe I can, you know? Because the Raspberry Pi is supposed to be able to support a 4K screen by now on this like tiny tiny little um gpu that's on it so it can sort of uh with, if it's not if it's not a difficult shader if right. it's a shader that i was running here before it can this shader the cloud that's doing volumetric calculations or something of the lighting inside of this fog volume mm, no thousand by thousand for that is the max I've been able to get from a Raspberry Pi token. And I think that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. That's not... <clears throat> nice. Very um, good. Just to also... I can't um, see the questions in the chat, by the way. If, if, yeah, no, I, I think I assume that's... you guys will read them a lot. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, okay. yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> as we said this and we posted the link to that asset in the chat as well so if people are looking for mm -hmm. it um, otherwise just go to the community post and search for shader or the community section on the website and search for shader you will find this including the links to the github um, repositories uh, to uh, download the whole thing and convert from shader toy to touch designer and then to uh, um, TD. Uh, yeah, I guess you said you're doing some post-processing. This is also one of those things that uh, you said yesterday, it's something you wished you had, um, doing post-processing on the shader itself and then um, having to write it back into the shader is a little bit, uh, yeah. you, you wish you could just output <laughs> that as a GLSL. Um, 
That it, yeah, that's one of those tasks that people often do in installations as well, like collapse different operators when you're, especially with ultra high resolution where every, um, where memory is really uh, precious, then yeah. uh, people collapse stuff into shaders and kind of have to figure out how our tops work in the background. So I guess you learn a lot about how tops work <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I've always, I actually don't know, but I've always assumed that the tops are, are just doing all the shader magic in the background, that they are shaders. Yeah, Is that that's true? right, yeah, 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 they're each, they're each their own little uh, GLSL render pass. But yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, what, what you're talking about is, I've been thinking about it ever since we made tops 20 years ago. Yeah. Is just one, one long big, big chain of chops and just be like, Boom. Yeah, collapse and export yeah, to a shader. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. I'd love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've always wanted to do that. It's just never, uh, it's never kind of come to the top of the uh, priority list. Yeah, but as, as Marcus says, in terms of performance, it can gain you a lot of performance just on that, but also just the, abil the ability to go in there and tweak a few little things that the tops don't quite do the way you want um, would be super nice also. And then and now you can export it and you can do that also. But yeah, so. Yeah. It's nice, to be reminded, nice to be reminded be of that. Cool, yeah, that would be a cool... Um, I mean, I did... So I remember uh, I went to the um, the Touch Designer uh, Summit in Montreal last year. And I remember there was this uh, Japanese guy um, who had done, like, he was VJing. He did this really... Uh, it was in, on the Open the open DJ mm -hmm. session. Open Gamers? Yeah. The Open oh, Gamers. Open, I wonder who that was. Was it... Uh... Uh, you guys remember? What did he have on Mario the screen? Mario Kakayoshi or uh, what did he have on it the could screen? Have, it could actually be it could actually be Mario Kakayoshi. It could be yeah. Um, but it, it it was just it. What was impressive about that particular um, piece was that uh, the amount of tops. It was just tops mm -hmm. with tops with tops with tops, and I was just standing there looking over his his um, his shoulder, going like, "What's your frame rate?" Like what? Because he's running from a, a laptop, and I've never seen that many tops in my life. Um, <laughs> doing that many like uh, insane passes, really. Um, cause it, it wasn't like it wasn't your normal like feedback system. It was like hundreds of tops. Uh, yeah. um, and I was standing there thinking, like, yeah, that that would actually be very nice to just collapse into collapse. Yeah. one shader. Um, yeah. yeah, sounds easy, but no, not easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Very useful, though. <laughs> yeah, one of those. Yep. Yeah, but good. Yeah. Um, did uh, did we want to have a look also at um, some of the um, shape? blending that you were talking about earlier or the animal yeah yeah yes i could do that and this is and this is really a really good opportunity to ask malcolm uh, any questions that you may have yeah let me just get the right touch of dino file up in this um, so, I have been, ever since, uh, this has this actually only come up with my work uh, with, with uh, candy stations, but um, this, uh, this idea of taking in meshes that are already made uh, that do animations. Um, so here we have an example of one of those star animals. Oh, I like it. And and I've actually I've broken these out into toxins and they are they are also on my GitHub. Um, but uh, what's important is that there's there's some few processing that needs to go into these FBX models when you uh, when you import them. Oops. I have yet to learn how to use a computer mouse on a Windows. <laughs> I shall use actual mouse. Um, so here, here's the, the point 
the points, and here is the FBX model. Um, and if we go into, this is just completely standard uh, imported FBX model. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fun thing about doing this uh, for this particular project was that a lot of them, they were all packaged differently, you know? So this one came with the animation data out here and the box, uh, there's a high poly, there's a super low poly, and there's a low poly. Um, and what I had to do in order to even get to those meshes was to, um, first of all, I wanted to reduce it. So I'm using the poly reduce here to reduce the, the mesh. I'm going to zoom in very, very, very much. Here, so you can see how, how reduced it is. And that's how I got it to be, uh, to look more like a zodiac and less like, um, less like a, a 3D mesh. Right. Let's see if, yeah. I, if I keep 100%, I zoom out now and we look at this box, it's just going to look completely like a, a mesh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh. It doesn't look like a zodiac. <laughs> um, it's you know, a very um, complex zodiac, hard to spot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so basically, there's a poly reduced there, and I'm only keeping like, it doesn't really matter, but like, like about 10%. It's different for all of the animals. And then the important one is the deform. So here, the deform um, gets put in, and it needs to point to the parent on FBX skeleton root path. Otherwise, this won't animate. So if uh, we don't do this, um, it, it won't it won't animate. Mm -hmm. You'll just have a completely static box out here. Yeah. Um, so what was what was my big big hurdle in this Malcolm is that the, that actually when you do this, uh, look at this beautiful does not know what to do with the point. <laughs> so turn it off. Uh -oh. Turning it back on. Um, so what was what was my issue is that all of the imported animals from Unity, once you import them, I'll show you because I have some in my project, that failed. I have quite a lot of failures. Um, here. Here's a box. Um, how they come in is it, uh, I wonder if this one I actually managed to fix, maybe. Yeah, how they come in is like this. So they'll come in with a mesh and then the bone group. That's how they're packaged. That's how when you use the FBX import tool, meaning when you go and you uh, do the, um, use this. When you do that and you choose here, the location of your your animal mm -hmm. um, and then you click import and you just pull replace from it because uh, otherwise you don't get it um it'll come in looking like this phone group no uh fuck matt um and this phone group is actually what makes my life miserable <laughs> because uh i found out that i had to delete the bone group put in the D form, and then uh, go back out, go back out. Um, so this may look like it's animating, but it's not actually mesh deforming. So if I took this and used it, you would not see anything moving. Um, there, nothing would, nothing moving out of this, but it's not working. But what I had to do is I went out here again at, to, on the FBX, and I actually have to do not a, uh, Full, I have to merge with existing after putting in the deform. So delete bone group, go back out, merge with existing. Oh, oh wait, delete bone group, put in deform, go back out, merge with existing, and then it will put in the bone group again. Okay. And then snap correctly. So, so the folks at Touch Designer, you guys, you did something smart because it works after. Uh -huh. After the remapping, uh, when I re-import merch with existing, um, but it was weird because all of these animals—they're all made from different makers because they're from the Unity assets store, right? 
So some of them it does work. I can put in the B form right away and it works. Hmm. Um, but for a lot of them, I actually had to, um, I actually had to do the re-import thing. Import twice. So, so I guess, so twice. I, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's dive into this. Um, so, so you're only doing the deforms using the SOP, and you're not doing a, a material-based deforms in this case, right? No, because I'm not using the material. I'm just, I just wanted the mesh. All right, you just want the mesh then. Right. Right. So, well, so the bone group. So the point of the bone group does two things: it cleans up the mesh because if it if it finds things that are captured with like you know 50 different weights per vertex, it'll throw away the weakest weights. Um, and it also it reduces the number of bones. Like if there's a whole bunch of bones that ne they're never actually referenced by mm. mesh, it also throws those away, and that makes the amount of data that needs to be uploaded to the GPU uh, much less. So that's uh -huh. that's the point of the bone group. Um, so it's not it, it's not technically necessary uh, to do de to be included for deforms to work. It's just kind of a cleanup tool uh, that we added a long time ago because we were getting very messy. Uh, Skeletons that need to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so I wonder. Well, if you delete it, it you shouldn't need, like you shouldn't need it afterwards. Like, uh, so the second re import confuses me a bit because it, it, you shouldn't need it at all because your uh, the deform on its own should just work with the original mesh. So, it'd be, uh, can, like, can you can you can you, can you maybe go through that, that process of importing yeah, I mean, just and then go fixing away. it? Yeah. I uh, well, I don't have. Well, yes, I can. I'm like, do I have the animals on here? Yes. Um. So here are all different animals that I that I have fixed it in. Uh. So in the background here, we got like well, elephant and turtle and dolphin. Um. And just to have a look at here, so this one was packaged kind of similar with uh, the spine and, and like all the animation data and the animation out here. And then again, uh, a little poly and so on. Elephant. Uh, let's see if this one's different. I forget which ones are like. The, yeah, so this one had um, oh the turtle the turtle was hard actually yeah so you'll see that the turtle did not have the animation out here in the first uh. layer like the um. All of the bones, uh, or they they weren't working. Um, so I had to for this one. I had to put them in here. Oh really? And then I actually do and do an in uh, chop for the animation data. So just this one, put that in there. Right. Um, and then name it export anim again, and then it magically works. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't, um, I don't know why people package their FBX models so wildly differently. Um, but this, like, and again, then it's the same with the poly reduce the deform. Um, but it, it, it makes it the import tool, uh, more difficult, uh, to handle. Yeah. It works with, like, big simo characters quite well, but, uh. Because they're all packaged the same way, but uh, Unity assets not packaged the same way. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah, it's very dependent on the exporter also because they they choose how to reinterpret their internal kind of uh, geometry uh, structure into the into the FBX format, and then we kind of have to reinterpret that ourselves back into the Touch Designer's way of thinking about things. So would, yeah, it's... would this be a task for the line mat? Here, oh. could you deform with the line mat? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty sure the line mat uh, would work with deforms. So, yeah, it's quite possible that 
these deforms could be done in the GPU. But at this low poly, probably not necessary one way or the other. Right. But yeah. Interesting. I'm yet yeah. to use the, the line mat. Yeah, the line mat's interesting in that it uh, creates, a, it should be used on the PC predominantly. Um, I think there's some issues with uh, compute shaders on the Mac. Is that? Uh, uh, well, it's, it's not compute, it's uh, geometry shaders. Geometry shaders, sorry. Yeah, geometry shaders on the Mac don't generally. Well, they, it, it works in a lot of cases, but I think there's a few cases where it. Fails. Okay, yeah, so it fails uh, in some yeah. cases. Uh, usually works on PC um, and lets you uh, create um, spheres or sprites per vertex. Uh, it lets you create nice um, lines where you have control over the thickness of the lines depending on distance uh, to the camera, uh, things like that. So um, yeah, adds a lot of um, possibilities when trying to do these nice um, wireframe models. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to... Um, I did see that, because it's, it's new, right? Yeah, it's pretty new, yeah. Like, oh maybe God. less than a year, just a year now. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah probably yeah, late 2019 or something. I did this on my Mac, so I'm like I'm really out of my out of my depth here. Let's see if this works. Um, yeah, here. So this is what usually happens. So now I just chose from the animations folder of the of the Unity model. I just chose that. I just did a full replacement and imported it. Um, and this is how it always looks when it comes in. Uh, it's all the animated points. Um, and here we have, I'm not sure this is the same turtle as the other one, by the way, because I have two turtles. Um, but here we have a dummy turtle, which contains nothing because the, the people at, at unit, uh, who did this unity and did not include the mesh with the animation. I think that was my issue. Um, so I have basically, I do have all the pelvis spine, so on, all the root data, neck. I do have the export animation, but I don't have the mesh. So I do have the mesh somewhere in my Unity file, okay. but but it wasn't included with the um, with the um, yeah the import because for some reason they just used this sea turtle dummy, which is supposed to have like correspond or to the mesh. Right. Um, so where to go from here? Uh, is I believe that I actually import it like in another FBX in here or something. Um, kept importing it until I found one that had a mesh, yeah. uh, which was wasn't in any any one of these. It was like the model. Then, if you just import the model, then you don't get the. Uh, then we will do the loggerhead. We'll do this one because. All right. So this is now from the models. Import that. So I see mesh, which is great. But if I went into this one, you see how it does not have the export anim. Because um, right. it doesn't have any of the animation, um, so this is this is like some of those those fun things that uh, that can can happen. So what I how I did how I, I think I might know how to fix this one. This literally took me two weeks to figure out uh, in this project. Um, but you know, it, no, 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 can't do. Might as well operator. Um, so this is when I did my in operator, um, and then did my export anim. Right. Just going to copy. Yeah. If, I if, don't know if it's maybe. Right. And then sometimes 
they auto do that. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's really weird, but sometimes I have to go and um, um, there. Sometimes I have to go and just like uh, restart the animation there. Oh yeah. Exact, just uh, mm. on off. Oh wait, not here. Out here. If if nothing's moving, you think it should be moving. Just just go and uh, and turn, start it again. Turn it off okay. and off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, wait, wait back. Yeah, the uh, you pro if the models re like is referring to skeletons of the exact same name, then you could also most probably actually just take, copy the model out and put it up a level. I bet you that would work also. Yeah, but then uh, actually, when I try to do that, then sometimes I um, I don't get the uh, correct um, the correct mapping for then the deform is the deform. Um, missing, like I said, it needs to be called parent dot. What did I say? Parent dot. Um, yeah. I'll look that. Oh, and it needs to. I've done this so many times. It needs to actually be in there, obviously. Yeah. Um. So this one right after the mesh, and then we actually get the deform. But this is why in that step that I sometimes have to go and reinforce in order for it to work. But oh, this one worked right out of the. Yeah. It's like what? What happens when it's not working? It's just not deforming. It's not deforming. Nothing it's happens. Static. If this one is still there, in there, then it, it'll it'll pop up with a message, uh, or uh, you know, it'll, I'll get a red error that says uh, um, that the the um, it can't find uh, the animation data or something. Like that. Yeah. It's a very cryptic message. I'll have to send it to you. Okay. Um, yeah. It's it's mentioned on it's mentioned on several message boards online. <laughs> Um, yeah. There's no no error with no um way to solve it, but I found out that the way to solve it is literally delete the bone group. And then if I do this, um you will see that that if I reimport this turtle now one more out. Here. You can still reimport but don't do full replacement, we do merge with existing. Um, and then import, and then what you'll see is that it has, in fact, which is quite brilliant, um, has, in fact, um, brought me back a bone group. But it still, it works. But that, this has fixed it for me. <laughs> why yeah. I do I, I assume, it, what happens if you just plug, if you plug the bone group into the D form? I'm just curious if that's what brings up the error that, uh... Yeah. That that might be it. Right. That does bring an error. No capture attributes. Yeah. So yeah, I think the issue is that the the, the bone group mangles the capture information in a way that only the uh, the GPU deformer knows about them. Um, so I don't think you need the bone group one way or the other for what you're trying to do. I think to just match the deform. Because I'm curious, I'm curious about why you need to reinforce that person that, or just possibly the animation is dying and being able to the animation. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll also speak to the export anim. Um, so what the way that uh, a lot of people know that this chops. So we click on the export anim and go to the common page. So the way it's doing its exports is the by the export method, which is channel name is path colon parameter. So instead of having to manually drag each of these channels to the TX, TY, TZ, RX, RY, or Z for all this massive skeleton. If you look at the channel exact match, you know exactly of all the skeleton nodes. And so that's why it's particular that it automatically pushes the exports out to all those uh, skeleton nodes. So you that's, mean uh, all of these channels? Yeah, yeah, they're named exactly what those node names are, uh, colon TX or colon TY. So it's an yeah. auto automatic export method that allows you to push out a ton of channels without having to manually wire them up. Mm -hmm. So that's what's ha that's what's uh why that particular node uh that's that's basically it didn't it, it, like the fact that it's called export and it doesn't matter and it's really just that one parameter there on it is what makes any null or any chop mm -hmm. uh, do this kind of uh, magic connection. 
that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so any null could do this, actually. Yeah. Any yeah. chop, yeah. Any chop, yeah. Any, any all chops. Any, any chop. Yeah. Chop. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can do, you can kind of um, look at. I think the parameter chop would give you also this uh, naming syntax if you're unsure. I believe. Um, let's see. Parameter render up and. Yeah, and then you can do um, uh, you can select an operator with a few parameters like the spine, the component down there, or something. Any component, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, and do what? Pull that into the operator parameter of the parameter chop, and then disable custom, the custom toggle. Enable built-in. Oh, and enable built-in. Yes. Yep. And now you get the parameters. If you middle mouse click, then you get all the names of yeah. them. So now you have the parameter names. But if you change the name format to be a, um, full path name or um, operator, there's the name format uh, parameter on the parameter parameters. Jesus, that's a lot of Yeah. This one, yeah. yeah. If you click on that and choose up and parameter names, then now the names are actually this uh, format where you have operator and then parameter. So mm -hmm. theoretically, if you would click the, if, if you would now change on the comment page, it would basically create a feedback loop. But if you change on the comment page, the um, export, um, uh, yeah, if you go to the comment page of this, these parameters, Wait, uh, this one? Oh yeah, oh sure, also on the parameter page itself, just to, on the common page. Oh, on here, yeah. Yeah, and then export method would be not that table, but channel name is path parameter. And now you could click the export flag, the green, um, the little green thing, yeah, and it would unable to remove because it's already being exported to. So now it's trying to export to all these parameters. It's not a good idea what we just did because it's taking the parameters and trying to export back to them. But just to, I would um, have to unflag this one, I assume. Yeah, and you would still get it. But then I would only you. have one one bone, would I? Oh, would I no. then only get the spine? Oh, I just wanted to show the uh, like how you also can get to the parameter to the right syntax mm -hmm. if you're unsure what the syntax is for that. Currently, it would literally it creates a big feedback loop, so it's not advised um, what I just did. But uh, yeah. Um, but this is a, that is another uh, question actually. Like, if it's possible to, um, it's possible to see the animation, and I just want the uh, it's here and they're dancing, so I just want the swinging arm. And then would be like, is there a way to actually select out these parameters specifically? Like, I only want the spine to be the thing that's moving because I really want very sort of mesh that only moves the spine. Yeah, you know, with chops, you can use this uh, slash chop and pull out you know, spine, star, and or, or pick a not spine, star, and lock those in the position that you want for it, and then you can replace chop to keep the, uh, the move parts that you're interested in uh, moving, and then have whatever you, know, what you want everything else to be doing, right? If you want if you want some sort of standard pose, or if you just want to zero out those transforms to whatever the model is rigged as. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah, uh, yeah. So it'd be just a select chop, and then, I don't know, a math or a replace chop. You can do that with these all these channels and manipulate them however you want. I'm going to do it before the export anim. Yeah, basically. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you just do yeah, it right, right between the the input and the export anim. And you could manipulate them there. For people oh. that don't have FBX models, um, right now the ability to mend that uh, the build folder is also a noise. The exclamation to get around with, okay. so don't have to out to find work FBX models. This uh, human is really nice uh, to play with. Um, actually, it currently default age that it is from. I want to do like a certain distance, and there you. How do I get to the samples folder? Um, you would do. Um, you on uh, go to your drive or something. Yeah. The, ah. the program files that one, and to riff. Okay. Oh. Designer samples. There's an PX. No humanoid. And the part. And take the humanoid. Um, to, uh, for example, you want to can um, you, you could uh, zero its channel here to make it uh, the the avatar and run 
a distance, but just stationary. Um, let me see, there's... I think it's yeah, because yeah, that's that's um that's actually that's, that's rude motion. You know, rude motion is when a three D model uh, their actual movement also propels them forward. And usually for Unity models, they all have rude motion. Um, so I was wondering that how to zero that out. Um, yeah. and in in the for the humanoid, for example, if you have the humanoid there. Um, it's the, mm -hmm. there's, there's three channels and I believe it must be the second channel, the TY for some reason. So if you um, just in front of the export anim put a mass chop, for example, I think that should already do it. And the mass chop has the possibility on the comment page to just uh, apply to a certain channel and then scope for the humanoid uh, humanoid hips TY, I believe it is. Yeah. And then on the multi add, oh, that didn't do it. Oh, that did, did not did not choose anything. Humanoid. Hips to buy. Okay. Huh. That is a bug. So what Not you, letting me do that. <laughs> <laughs> what you could do instead is just type in. Uh, oh, just star hip colon ty. Yeah, star. Maybe. Oh, oh that'll I think so. Ones. Yeah, that should do it. Uh, star. Yeah, where is star? On? There we go. Uh, yeah. I usually am using a Danish keyboard. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, uh, where's the star? Star hips. hips. Uh, put hips with a capital H. Mm -hmm. And then colon. Yeah. TY, yeah. And hit enter. And now if you, on the multi-add or something like that, if you multiply by zero, yeah. There. Oh, look at that. Very yeah, useful. Stationary. So you can, yeah, as Malcolm said, you can fiddle around with these channels one by one or in groups or whatever. Yeah. Oh. Very, very smart. Um, yeah, I wonder what happens if you make some of the arm motion, <laughs> like multiply some of the arm motion by 10. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a good VJ uh, patch. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, nice, good. Very nice. I also just tried out with the line material, but I cannot get points to render, that's unfortunate. I, cannot, I get the, um, I, uh, what I did for the humanoid to do what you did um, there was that I would um, add the poly reduce after the bone groove and yeah. Um, then kind of copy the deform parameters into the line material. Um, but yeah, I just get the lines. I don't get the the points, unfortunately. Should check mm. that more. Uh, I guess port that bug. Yeah. Oh, actually, oh, that's funny. It runs beside the guy. Ah. Oh, so they're there, but they're missing a translation? Yeah, yeah. They're translated differently. Uh, that okay. might be a something in my uh how the how the deform is set up here i'll check that maybe yeah it could just be a, a bug in how the uh the points are instanced on that that's good too nice i was gonna <laughs> say that it, it, it gets really interesting once you can deform the the mesh from that and you get those points then you um you can um you can go in and get get some very interesting looks um, for your, uh, your animals. This one, I believe, is down here. Mm -hmm. here. So I was messing around with trying to make a plexus system based on uh, Hakeda 12's uh, um, tutorial on that. But he does it all on tops, which blew my mind because he does Pythagoras in a mm -hmm. top just with black to white 
and because it's all within the zero to one space, yeah, that that can be done. Back back to why shaders are meaning. Um, but uh, I, then, then I had to, in order for that to actually work on my animal, I had to make my animal between zero and one for all points. So I had to like downscale my animal until it was tiny. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but here it was another like uh, this is the. The remainder of the Piketa 12 tutorials, or let's ignore that. Uh, I came upon, you know, just just simply taking in the verdicts data, which is also what I'm doing when I'm just instantiating uh, anything at the at the, uh, the lines or whatever. I'm getting with the chop two here and the limit. Mm -hmm. uh, so very interesting. Um, ways that it could look i think yeah yeah um, good ways to play around with subs nice <laughs> yeah i really i really like these um i really like that you can take in any 3d animation and and make it so rudimentary because like in in terms of uh, we spoke about you know design and art earlier like this line this continuous line of like i'm sure you've seen the installations where where uh, a human's movement is reduced to just uh, what is it, twelve or sixteen points of just an LED being moved by a motor, and you're actually seeing a human. Um, mm -hmm. Was it for a Nike thing? I don't know. Um, but but you're seeing a human, and and in terms of like when is something designed and when is something art, which is something that we discussed uh, at ITP. Um, a lot. Uh, it's like I think that, that you know now th this is clearly no longer a fox match, but it still has like those animal qualities, mm -hmm. um, and this begins to read more as like abstract art, and I think that's that's really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But then I just obviously this one is running through all of the animations, like so I need to like take out samples of animation. So is there a way to do that? Is there a way to say I only want this little sample of animation. Because in Unity, you do blend trees and you have like nice blending, but is that something you would do in touch design or is it all done outside in, in like Blender or something? Mess with the the actual like looping of the animation. Well, yeah, there's lots of options there. Like you could record the, you could use a record shop and record the animation that you're interested in, right? Um, and then start looping that instead. Uh, because essentially, uh, like if you go into one of your graphic access, Right. All you need to do is replace what th those channels that are coming in uh, that are going into the export anim, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, like you, you can record you can record like a segment that you're interested in and start playing that back instead into the export anim. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I forget exactly what the controls are. Hold on. There's um, we do have animation controls for uh, yeah. like trimming and uh, things like that as well oh yeah there's trimming yeah. so like on the fpx component itself uh there's uh controls for trimming the animation yeah i saw i saw that um i saw that up here um on the speed was it like no there right uh somewhere was it here uh <laughs> play page, sure. uh play yeah yeah, so there's yeah, Q and yeah. trim. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're just looking to trim it, then yeah, that's the, uh, the way to do it. If you want to pull out a particular segment of your, of your animation. An infinite loop of him maybe walking. Yeah. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Near something. I think it, it is. It probably does uh, do a loop uh, if I just could hit it completely. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I got I got very creative with with all of these star animals and stuff. So so I ended up um, I ended up building a, a bunch of different uh, this one sprouts uh, particles at the edges. Uh, this one sprouts particles at the edges, but it looks better. Um, because I actually, 
this is this is from an old patch that I did that uh, was also for candy stations that um, was for using the Keening project, uh, which is another music video, which is on her website, not on mine, just yet. But here yeah, oh, we nice. actually built her a mm -hmm. whole tool of uh, mm -hmm. of capture. So this is a neuron that she 3D modeled in Cinema 4D. And I was messing about with like making L system branches that can that can grow out. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool! My, my L system coding skills are not not so great yet. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very interested in it. It's natural design, very cool. Um, but uh, yeah, and then like particles, and I actually ended up doing there are two different particle systems. One that chooses um. One that chooses random points and gets attracted to them, so it ends up being like sort of like these um, signals that run through the neuron. Uh, it's a little hard to see from, from this file, so but basically it'll it'll choose an area and make way more particles yeah. for a little while that get attracted to to hook point, um, and then otherwise it's just also shedding particles all the time. It's really nice. And then, like, some camera control here. Just, like, how how fast it should be moving and stuff like that. Your speed. Um, yeah, but this is this is why I like touch design. And this is why we, we use it in, in, like, the music video work. Because uh, this outputs siphon, so we can also just... I think you can capture now, right? But can you count, capture with alpha? Uh, yeah. Like you mean yep. um, rendered out? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually have been just sending out Siphon because uh, uh, I don't think that it worked very well last time I tried it on my Mac. Uh, but I think it does work here on my PC. Which, by the way, I got like two weeks ago. So I'm not, I'm a Mac person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's quite the change. <laughs> um, yeah, this is like the, that's the, the recorder thing now, right? What's it called? Uh, yeah, you can do it with the uh, movie uh, uh, movie file out, or there is under file in the file dialog. There's also an um, export movie. Um, mm. The export movie kind of takes care for you um, of. Yeah, there, by the way, yeah, animation in RGBA, you get a transparency there. Um, yeah, there's only a few codecs that support alpha. I guess we have HapQ alpha as well. There's, yeah, there's animation HapQ alpha and then uh, Notch LC does alpha also. Yeah. yeah. Where do you choose the, uh, where do you choose the, uh, the HapQ? There so, it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm like super blind. There we go. Yeah, so you do have Q, and then there should be, and, and then the, then you change format to RGBA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, that works. What it takes care for you is that it turns off the real time flag when it's rendering yeah. out movies um, automatically, which is nice. So I get the the actual real frame rate that things should be running at. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Skip any frames. Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is the same in, in Unity because you know when we make a we make like the FBX in Cinema 4D and it's completely timed to the song, uh, and then I will import the MP FBX here and like with the neuron for instance do this post processing stuff, and then export it because then she will recompose it the two sometimes the two layers together. So it's really that that stuff is really important. Um, all right. I like this idea here with the particles and your animals. Yeah. This is yeah, me too. super nice. Uh, yeah. I like the really naive, the ones that you had really sort of deformed completely. Like it reminded me of what, you know, someone like Picasso or Brocker would have done with Touch Designer. You know what I mean? Like, uh, oh, thanks. Animate, animate <laughs> Guernica. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really love those. 
and the, I mean the particles are gorgeous too. It's uh, just very whimsical and mm. beautiful. To me, the particles look like the animal shedding, but uh, not not um, shedding, shedding. Shedding. Yeah. Uh, okay. Shedding. Yeah. But uh, and I I don't think they're quite there yet. I want them to like follow the mesh a bit more. Uh, which is actually a little difficult because the the particles are moving a, away and like have they have their own behavior right and then the mesh is also moving so all the points that they want to be attracted to like for instance the the uh, neuron isn't moving so it's easy for the particles to stick on contact mm -hmm. but if i if i do stick on contact um for uh for this one it will well, it, it, it won't, it'll, it'll stay in the, I didn't use the other one. Um, right. Turn, turn no, it, it'll stick in space, not mm -hmm. to the mesh. Yeah. So the particle will, will remain floating out here because the fox was doing a, a move while, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't stick actually with, it sticks with the point at the position where the point was at that time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So any of these particles here, if I, if I was to show that the geometry, uh, did I put the particles on the point? No, I did not. Oh, and these work. Uh, there. Yeah. Whenever I do, it's bound on contact with this. But here, stick on contact, and they'll, they'll stay wherever they, they were. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, um, it's already been, um, it's almost four. Yeah, so we should. Uh, so we're probably going to wrap it up soon. Wrap it up. But uh, we did mean to ask a little bit, sorry, uh, one more thing to ask was because you have some experience actually also with um, teaching. Yes. Um, you did a project at, that was at Tush, I believe, right? Your um, P5 shader book that you made yeah. as an um, educational device as well. And yesterday you said you were teaching uh, children as well. And mm -hmm. in a high school, I believe, if I remember right. And you did teach them a little bit uh, touch designer even. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even touch younger designers. kids. Yeah. Yeah, touch designer is what, what I was saying yesterday. Touch designer is fun with kids because they uh, they know it, it's like in, instinctually easy for them to understand how to connect notes whereas if you present them for like some, some processing or something like depending on how, how young they are um, they it, it's not fun because they got to write text so, so that like yeah. um, using touch designer or node based programming I've also used scratch depending on the children's age you know um, it makes them more interested in them learning how it functions under sure. the hood with like the actual code. So if they first see how it works and then they, they redo it, um, in code that works. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And th th I guess that also came from your own experience as well, where you said that, uh, visualizing certain things, um, helps you understand, uh, problems more like yeah. that are usually theoretical than putting that um visualizing it makes it more clear and the shader book is similar right you also visualize these um on the website right away yeah so this is a this is a project that i did um while at icp with uh casey conchina who i still work with quite a lot um we dj together and uh we both work for, for James also. Um, so uh, it occurred to me while I was at ICP that so many people are dead scared of shaders, right? Um, and and it, it's a thing that's really useful for people to know, programmers to know, um, because you can do so much more. Uh, like if you have P5, it's basically processing, for those of you if you're not familiar. It's a JavaScript processing language. Um, and what you can do is that uh, you can draw 
objects to the screen and just like in processing but if you can put shaders onto those objects you have much more of a dynamic um, 3d environment basically and then we found out that, that the while Bobby 5 had implementations of shaders it didn't really um, it wasn't really documented well and people were still scared to use it because there wasn't like a really 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 ultra soft landing for beginning programmers to start mm -hmm. using it so there is like the book of shaders um online that i've always been directed to whenever i speak about shaders the people are like yeah we tried this one but it's it is a little bit hard to understand if you've just understood what an if statement is um right and i think that what Oh yeah, no, just agreeing. It's if you yeah. have trouble with if statements, then yes, yeah. Uh, so, so, and and that's where P five's community, uh, you know, people will often come to P five from from no programming background. Um, my throat is in a little bit. <laughs> um, so, so we're like, well, how can we actually write an introduction that's about shaders? Um, that um, will allow people to understand this, like from from the tiny little details. So this is an example here. Like, okay, what if we were doing? What if we loaded all the pixels into memory on the CPU, not the GPU? So what if we didn't use a shader? So we can see that it's running at five frames per second versus if we run it. At I just lost my sound for a second. Um, so these are we made a website that's interactive that people can um, can play around with this and try to understand what shaders are and how to write them. Uh, and included this wonderful video by Mythbusters that Very shows cute. how shaders work. Yeah, it's funny. That's actually a good video to watch. Yeah. It's, uh, so, uh, Great explanation for it. <laughs> it is. It made the Mona Lisa with the last cannon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we we uh, presented this at the processing day here in New York uh, last last year, or maybe it was the beginning of this year before everything went uh, working. Uh -huh. well. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is. Uh, exactly how to write shaders. What what do you, uh, um, what? How do you actually write them in in J in JavaScript? Um, mm -hmm. uh, how do you include them? So you have your JavaScript, you have your vertex file, you have your fragment file. Yeah. And we go through what each line means. So this is like the really really soft landing for people who are not ready for book of shaders. So we called it like. The booklet of shaders. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Everyday language. So not threatening. And there's also um there is also um shader chart course here. Yeah. Um and so I believe that uh, Casey right now is actually working on uh trying to court some of the shaders that he's done in touch designer in here. Um I don't know, probably a tutorial of how to do that at some point, too. Yes. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be an automatic button click or if it's just going to be like you copy paste, like, or something. Maybe so you're cutting out a little bit here and there. So oh, I think, I think my headphones are almost out of battery. Okay. Okay. So, if well, you they're off completely, I want you to hear that we were very, 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 uh, thrilled to have you with us today. That was, uh, I mean, today and yesterday we talked a lot and uh, much inspiration. We, we, there are a few topics we missed, like uh, you did want to talk about the difference in our in our industry, well, versus say the art community of how, uh, how, we, uh, how, how we attribute art, right, as the one artist versus the uh, a group of a collective that makes something because as you keep pointing out you know it takes a lot of people to make what you make or oh, but I guess we should leave that for another day 
Yes. Campfire topic, indeed. Yeah. So, that's, yeah. That's all. I think it's important to, for everyone in the community to keep thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think our community is good that way. So, but still. I think so, too. So, guys. Um, yeah. Thank you to, thank you to uh, our, our, uh, our uh, community in the chat and everyone for watching today. And uh, um, wishing everybody uh, very good holidays and uh, looking forward to 21. No, I was going to say 21 21, but that's getting ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Louisa, for joining. Yes. Yeah. Um, really happy that you could make it for this and uh, to thanks for contributing to the website and for publishing yeah. your work um, online and sharing your knowledge. That's always um, it's one of those things that is really nice uh, that working Absolutely. for artists, but still being able to um, uh, show how things are done. So thank you very yeah. much for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're very happy to have you. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, and looking forward to hearing more. Um, I think we had all the information for Louisa. We, um, I always had down in the bottom here a little bit, um, Louisa, your URL, uh, your website URL, but I post it again in the chat just in case people want to contact you. That's probably a um, good way to do that. And yeah, with that, uh, have nice holidays. And um, I guess we'll see each other again in January perhaps so in the new year another exciting year yes another exciting year and and guys do go to uh yeah. in session and send us your uh send us your networks and proposals and let's uh let's have more in sessions in 21 correct yes let's do that all right all, all right. right so adios yep see you all later <laughs> thanks again Lisa. it was a pleasure mm -hmm. thank you bye, -bye. bye, -bye.